So um, the agenda, a little bit of agenda for today, I hope I can stick with the time, otherwise I will interrupt uh, at any point if I'm too late. Um, I choose a couple of examples for you from the long-standing fields of activity that we have uh, in this, uh, in this area, arena. So the first one I call it making sense of missense uh, in target cancer therapy. This is my horse battle for many, many years. And uh, mm, I, we will try to show you some of the examples on how we can predict the results of missense mutations in uh, cancer, uh, in, in oncogenes actually, how they respond to cancer therapy how this can be predicted by computer and eventually verified uh, by a proper experiment. Then I will show you an example of how we can develop uh, new anti-cancer drugs, which goes under the title of hitting the right spot, and I will show you quickly how, to, uh, how we've been involved in many years to develop a STAT3 inhibitor uh, for targeting cancer. And eventually, if I got some more spare time, I will show you a little bit of our experience in designing, synthesizing, and testing new non-viral nanovectors, especially for gene therapy. So just as a brief hint of introduction, everybody, you are certainly more qualified than I, uh, audience, to uh, know that the last two decades have witnessed uh, an, an enormous um, uh, development uh, in the understanding and the knowledge of the molecular basis of cancer. And nobody can deny that nowadays cancer is viewed as a disease with origins in the alterations of genes, uh, specific gene particularity within the cell. And uh, thanks to the great efforts of the Cancer Genome Challenge, we are now discovering every day more and more cancer genes, uh, which are connected, uh, set the basis for um, development uh, progressions of cancer in humans. Uh, among them, uh, a crucial role of all the genes are those that codify for particular enzymes. Uh, which you certainly know very, very well, that are tyrosine kinases, and especially receptor tyrosine kinases play a, a major role in um, very, very many cancer setting and progression. Um, the uh, activations of these um, uh, enzymes normally triggers a cascade of biochemical reaction, which in turn uh, give rise to nuclear translocations of several DNA binding protein, and in turn, these proteins give uh, action or switch off uh, set of genes which proceed to many, many cellular uh, important processes like uh, growth proliferations, migration, invasions, and apoptosis. Uh, obviously, then, any disturbance to the signal transduction pathway will uh, potentially, can potentially result in a cancerous lesion and transformation. But ironically, uh, this concept is essential from a therapeutic viewpoint because we can think, and this is the underlying concept of cancer target therapy, that the production, so the expression of this alter gene, uh, that code for enzymatic activity can become, in turn, a target for no small compound that can uh, hit these molecular target and by hitting them, inhibiting their activity. Uh, and, and so this, I, this is why I selected some of the examples in this field. And uh, one of the titles is Greeting from Hell. And you will understand immediately why Greetings from Hell uh, is a subtitle for this subject. Um, here we have an example of three pathologies, so three tumors, uh, three proteins underlying the etiology of these tumors, and one drug for those. So I'm talking about chronic myeloid leukemia. I'm talking about gastrointestinal stromal tumor and the FIPAL1, PDGRF, hyper-esionophilic syndrome. So these three diseases uh, have uh, different pathogenetic mechanisms, but what is really important is that they share a pathological deregulation of specific tyrosine kinase. BCL able for chronic myeloid leukemia and C-kit for GIST and plated factor receptor alpha for the HACE. Uh, well, I'll give a brief introduction. I know, certainly, I'm sure that you know all these three tyrosine kinases, but just for those who don't know about those, so the BCR uh, is a very large cytoskeleton associated product of an aberrant gene, the chimeric gene, the gene Philadelphia, which uh, originates from the translocation of the portion of the serine threonine uh, kinase ABL uh, and the uh, tyrosine kinase of BCR, or vice versa. Uh, and these 
um, mo molecule is the renowned etiological agent for the setting of the chronic myeloid leukemia. And it is the paradigm of all cancer target therapy because for this molecule, the first uh, small molecule target has been developed, as you all know. Everybody knows about imatinib and the story of the success of this drug for chronic myeloid leukemia. This is really opening avenues in the treatment of patients suffering from CML. Uh, but as any other, as all gold bullet, um, unfortunately, even imagine it turned to a thin bullet after many years because a patient that show a very, very good uh, cytologic, cytological remissions in this case turned up with the disease again. And one of the most cases, uh, because these things happen, is because these patients have point mutations, specifically in the kinase domain of BCA rebel. KIT is a transmembrane receptor. We will talk about this a little bit later. So KIT is a transmembrane receptor uh, that normally serves as a receptor for the stem cell factor. Uh, and is found mutated active and constitutively active in most of the gist. Uh, on the other hand, the last protein, so the, the combination of FIPL1 and platelet hydrofactor receptor alpha is a combination of a MR uh, binding protein, uh, RNA binding protein, sorry, and uh, the platelet hydrofactor receptor alpha. So these three proteins, two aberrant and a, and a, and a regular quotation, tyrosine kinases, uh, precede the onset and the development of this kind of tumors. Uh, all these proteins, are inhibited by this um, drug, imatinib, which, as this is one of the problems that we have in cancer target therapy, I, normally these inhibitors are very effective, but of course cannot be highly selective. And this is one of the problems that you see. So three different proteins are hit by the same molecule. So you have to keep in mind when you design drugs for these problems here. So uh, during the age uh, and the years, we have uh, collected several information about the mechanisms that uh, precede the acquired resistance for imatinib in CMLGist. We have um, less evidence for uh, the most rare he, uh, ES, HES. But and certainly, we can discuss a lot. So we have many, many molecular reasons for that. We have uh, clone expansion. We have gene amplifications. But among all the mechanisms that can come to your mind, certainly one of the most frequent um, incidents that we have is that we have uh, some point mutations, as I said before, in the kinase domains of the protein. Specifically, one of the most nasty mutations that we can find for which at the moment there's no available inhibitor except for ponadine, and I'll talk a little bit later, that is able to block the activity of bcr uh, mutated in position 314 when the, the threonine is substituted for an isoleucis. And this is why I titled this talk Greetings from Hell because this mutation is so aggressive that this is called the mutation from Hell. So there is only one inhibitor I would say that is able to block the activity of this uh, aggressive mutant, which is ponatinib. Ponatinib is a wonderful drug from this respect, but it has been withdrawn from clinical trials last year because uh, it turned out to be problematic from the cardiotoxicity point of view. So they are trying to, you know, better in the properties of panatinib uh, and uh, while preserving the activity toward this mut uh, mutant protein. But the same mutation has been seen in KIT. So the same position, KIT codified for uh, bcr abel codifies for KIT. So we have the same substitution, number 670. And as far as he HES is concerned, we have the same, again, uh, point mutation that is being reported. If you align the three proteins, uh, you will see that these positions are homologous. So you have the same substitution in the same ATP binding pocket. So at the core, at the activity, uh, at the core, at the central uh, core, I said the central core of the, where, where the activity of the kinase takes place. So in a, in a collaboration with the Institute of um, Instituto Tumori di Milano, uh, they, they came up with a question and say, why uh, in this patient we only see T versus I? Um, it, it, it might be any other um, amino acid um, compatible with the, uh, with the codons, of course, in the cDNA of the patients. And why we don't see, uh, even with highly sophisticated technique, other um, substitution at that position? Is there any molecular reason for that that you can anticipate eventually? Uh, so yeah, I accepted this, um, this challenge. 
And uh, I start playing with the genetic code, so the code on where the, uh, the cDNA of the patient is this one. So uh, ACA is the original sequence of the, of the codon. So we permutated all the possibilities, changing the first base, the second, and the third, and we came up with all these possible substitutions. So the code is redundant for T, which is sensible. But then you see that we have other uh, amino acids that can, take, uh, uh, can be originated at that position, like uh, um, arginine, isoleucine, lysine, alanine, serine, and proline. Uh, well, this, why, why I'm talking to you about this? Because it's, um, for me, it's, um, it's been a, a big strike. Because uh, normally, what you do, you have an experiment. You have some results. You come to the modeler and says, look. I see this, I don't, maybe there got some molecular reasons in the background, so you can maybe try to do some of your alchemical uh, things in the computer and come up with an answer to me trying to explain my experimental evidence, which is normally the way that people consider modeling. Uh, well, we did, which is, it's a top-down approach. Uh, this time, uh, my friends in Milan make me shiver a little bit because they want me to do a bottom-up approach. So they say, you first predict, and then we go to the lab and see, which is something that, you know, makes a little bit nervous because you, it's easy when you, you know where you have to go. So you, you do, you experiment, and at least you hope that you come up with the truth. But in this case, you have no reference point. So you, you're up to your own, and you try to predict the things, and then go back. So as I promised, I will not give you uh, mathematical or physical details. So you have to trust me on what you're going to say from how the computational results have been predicted. Uh, but I just want you to keep in mind these two lines I'm going to show you. That's the only thing you have to remember from a mathematical viewpoint, OK? And so make a little effort for me. So we have the free energy of binding. That means you have two bodies, which be a protein and a drug, or maybe two proteins, or DNA and nanovector, whatever. They come together, they interact, okay? In doing this, they can do three things. They can free energy, so that the energy of the complex is lower than the energy of the two separated bodies. So you have a thermodynamically spontaneous process, and the complex will form. Okay? And the difference in free energy will be negative because energy will be free to the environment, right? If you have a free energy difference equal to zero, you will have equilibrium, okay? The things will attach and detach, attach and detach. And unluckily, if you have a, a delta G uh, uh, free energy binding positive, that means that thermodynamically the process is not spontaneous. So you have to act in a way. You have to act a catal act catalyst, or you have to play with temperature or pressure. So you have to induce, from a thermodynamic point of view, the complexation. Okay? This is also from, if you scratch your mind from, I think, not, not even university, but probably high school, you can remember that the free energy of a process is given by the a difference of two terms, enthalpy minus entropy. You remember delta H minus T delta S? This can be calculated by computer. At the very end, by a simple law and a fundamental law of thermodynamics, you can calculate the free energy uh, value of binding of complex formation to the IC50 value or the KD value, if you prefer, which are one uh, the opposite of the other. That means, for instance, at IC50, I would like to remind you of what it is. It is the concentration, for instance, in this case, uh, uh, of, of a drug to re uh, required to inhibit 50% of, a, in this case, of kinase activity. Okay? So by computer, you can predict all these numbers. And I would like now you to make a last effort and consider that you have two proteins. One is mutant, one is wild type, and the same drug. For instance, imatinib. So imatinib is binding to the wild type protein. You will have a free energy binding for this complex. And then imatinib is binding to the mutant protein. And you have another free energy binding. Well, then you take the difference of these two. All right? So you take the free energy binding of the wild type minus the free energy of the mutant. If you do this operation, it's very simple mathematics to show you that this difference of difference, forgive me the, the trick of word, but it's, it's the way it's called, if this number is negative, okay, the drug is less affine for the mutant than for the wild type. That means that you have drug resistance. Okay? Just keep in mind the simple concept, nothing more to remember. Delta, delta G minus zero, less affinity, or drug resistance. That's only mathematics I ask you to keep in mind for the rest of the process. 
So for the in vitro experiment, what we've done here is that we uh, construct all these mutants that I show you from the playing with the, uh, with the uh, genetic code. And uh, we're constructing them, say, the rate of mutagenesis. And then uh, uh, we use for these um, an expression vector that was carrying a specific kit mutation uh, that was carrying a deletion in position 599. Uh, well, you ask me why this? Because um, the experience that we have in the field shows that most of the patients uh, that comes with GIST uh, have this mutation here that is located in the juxta membrane domain of the kit protein, which, by the way, is this blue region here, okay? And why they have this mutation? This mutation is kit activating. So in the presence of uh, the deletion of residue 559, kit is constitutionally activated and the gist is setting on. Uh, Ironically, I would say, uh, for patients that have this situation here, the uh, treatment by imatinib is much more effective than from patients, more rare, because there are no many patients in GIST that feature wild-type kit. And the reason is very simple, because the, uh, when, the mutation, when the 559 residue is in place, uh, the shape of the just a membrane domain, just a little bit, uh, hamper imatinib binding in by you know intruding in the uh, imatinib binding pocket. Whereas in the presence of the deletion mutant, the uh, just a membrane domain assume a different conformation that allows imatinib to bind much more comfortably within the protein binding site. So as I say, ironically, if you have this disease, you have this mutation, but having this mutation, the therapy is much more effective for you than for other person that have a white type kit. So then using this uh, blank uh, uh, test for this, this gene for a uh, blank test, then we transfect uh, green monkey kidney uh, COS1 cells and, uh, with a construct. And then we perform immunoprecipitation, immunoblotting, and then cytometry uh, studies to evaluate the kit expression and phosphorylation. Uh, we also tr uh, incubated these uh, transfected cells with imatinib, uh, a different concentration to see how they respond to the drug and to uh, confront our results with the uh, computational results with the experiments. Now let's see what we got. So this is uh, the computational results. I'm going to show you numbers. Uh, I can show you, I will show you also beautiful images. Now numbers are more important than images. So have a look at the table. Uh, this is our prediction of how kid will behave with respect to ATP. So his normal metabolite. So the tyrosine uh, kinase get phosphorylated to start the action. So their natural metabolite is ATP that enters the pocket and phosphorylate tyrosines uh, to trigger the signal cascade. So as you see, now you remember what I said, right? So uh, tyrosine and isoleucine are, ve these numbers delta G are very negative. Okay? So being very negative, this means they are highly affine for ATP. So they should be happily phosphorylated, both the native and the isoleucine carry mutant. A little bit less happy to be phosphorylated will be alanine, serine, and um, lysine. And decidedly ha less happy to be phosphorylated will be proline and uh, arginine. I will also call them really loss of function. And why I will call them? Because you have to keep in mind the number. Uh, a difference in free energy of only 1.4 kcal per mole means one order of magnitude less affinity, right? Okay, so if you see here, this is even a little bit more happy than this to be phosphorylated. And here we are talking about one to two orders of magnitude uh, less affine to ATP. And here we are orders of magnitude less affine to ATP. This is why I would call them less of function. So let's go on. So that's as what I said, and my ranking for this uh, experiment would be that these two will be highly phosphorylated, this little bit less, this will be probably not phosphorylated or called a dead kinesis. Uh, well, the reason why is this, this is a uh, three-dimensional model of ATP in the binding pocket, and you can clearly see if you compare here the mutant, the nasty mutant from hell, and this is arginine in the same position. I choose these two because it's very significant, because this is very happily phosphorylated, it is not. And you will see that if you put arginine with very huge 
and charge amino acids within the binding pocket in this case, all amino acids will move from uh, you know, their original position and the binding site of the protein will be highly distorted. So being highly distorted, the cavities will open up and ATP will go in and will also pop up without having time to donate one of the phosphate group to the corresponding tyrosine. And if you, th this can be also seen here, if you compare the three, this is a zoom view of the binding sites. Here you have the delta 559. Here you have the uh, threonine versus isoleucine mutant. And this is the arginine. You, even if not an expert eye, can see that these two guys look really much like one another. And this one is really different. So let's see what is going on when you get imatinib. That was for ATP. For imatinib, what we got? Now you know the trick again. This is what you have to take a look at. So this is a delta G, which is cut off. I'm sorry. I don't know why this is cutting off uh, some of the, of the Greek. This is delta G, and this is delta delta G. But now you know you're the master of delta G so far. So what you see is that we have the uh, tyrosine, which is the wild type uh, position that is very, very highly affine to the imatinib. So minus, minus 10.2 kcal per mole, which is a very, very strong affinity. So we have a strong decrease in the presence of isoleucine, so minus 3.8, it's more, more than two orders of magnitude, and an intermediate behavior for these three guys here. And well, I test this one even without making much sense because we know that there are you know, less, of, less of function kinases. So at the very end, for the affinity for imatinib for all these mutants, I came up with this rank. Threonine is much, much less affine than these three bunch of guys here. And these should be much, much more affine than these other two remaining kinases. Now come to your side. And well, this is just a little bit of explanation of molecular, what is going on. So uh, in this place here, when you have, I have threonine here, there's a nice hydrogen bond with this nitrogen of imatinib, which clearly cannot be any longer because uh, isoleucine has no hydroxyl group to make this hydrogen bond. Plus, these amino acids is very bulky and then induce a confirmational change of the drug within the binding site that reverts ultimately into a loss of uh, grip. Uh, this rearrangement also causes the drug to clash again one of the other amino acids, which is um, tyrosine 823. And at the very end, what you can see is that the binding pocket of the protein really narrows onto the drug, so the drug really can't fit inside the modified binding site in the presence of isoleucine. The, all this can be quantified by numbers when you can read it in the paper. I just give you the main concept, so not dwelling with the details. So let's see what the experiment says. So these are the Western work that you can see here. And as I, um, and these are the densitometric uh, results. And as you see, what the results claims here is that uh, Tyrosine and isoleucines are very, very happily phosphorylated. Look at the you know, percentage of phosphorylation that comes out from the densitometric studies. Then followed by serine, alanine, and lysine. And the very, very last, these two guys here that are practically not phosphorylated. But isn't that what we predicted by computer? Having all this stuff here takes months, you know, better than I. I, I, I just think that I'm talking to you that taking this tank really much, much less time predicted by the computer. At least you have to verify your data. Nobody will trust only a computer. You have to uh, you know, uh, verify what you predict. But once you have verified your prediction, then you know that you can use the computer to get really, really on a very much, much shorter time scale the results that you needed. So about the imatinib, is, what, is, what, is, what is going on with imatinib? So we drop proline and uh, arginine because we knew that that were not going to be phosphorylated, so not that we didn't perform this calculation, this experiment with this. But again, if you, these results are just for an example, shown a five micromolar imatinib, and then you see that threonine is switched off, isoleucine is not switched off, and this guy here is something in between. Uh, these are the data quantified by densitometry, and what at the very end you come out is that Threonine is much, much more responding than the trees guys here, which in turn are much, much more responding than isoleucine. And once again, is this exactly what we predicted by computer? Uh, 
that in summary brings me to some conclusions for this first part of the seminar that is that uh, we be believe that one of the reasons why this mutation here is bound to be naturally selecting in the matinib resistant GIST patient is that because proline and uh, arginine are loss of function mutations so are not useful for the tumor because they will not get phosphorylated, they will re go anywhere. Uh, these three guys might eventually be happening, but it's not going to be a problem because they're going to be switched off uh, physiologically available uh, imaginative conditions, so we will not see them. And at the very end, there are different factors that contribute to uh, affinity of these proteins towards ATP and towards imatinib, but in, as a matter of fact, only this guy here is a selective advantage you know, to uh, tumor under the conditions of imatinib treatment. And then I make a little historical jump. That, that song I, sung, I just sang was dated five, or five years ago. Um, but it was instructive because it was, one of, as I say, one of the blank tests that um, was you know, uh, proposed to validate the methodologies. It was very, very instructive. And, uh, and that was uh, published in the Journal National Cancer Institute at that time. Uh, this piece of a seminar that I'm going to show you now is uh, much more recent. I presented this paper last year, the AACR and CIRTC meeting in Boston, and um, it, it's, it's very new, and the results are really, really uh, very, very recent. Um, and this is the reason why they selected that for, for, for presentations. And concerns, uh, at, at a very hot topic so far. Again, we remain in cancer. And, but this time we are talking about basal cell carcinoma. Uh, so this type of cancer is one of the most frequent skin cancer. And there has been an increase in incidence of this tumor type in the last 30 years. Uh, the treatment for BCC are different. Uh, for those amenable to this treatment, the preferred, the preferred uh, type of treatment is surgery and the different um, um, techniques. Otherwise, we can treat this pathology with radiotherapy, photodynamic therapy, or eventually miquim. I cannot say miquim. Uh, but um, for those cancer that are uh, really difficult to treat with surgery, so they are not amenable for that, like locally advanced or metastatic BCC. Now, in the recent year, uh, uh, a plethora of small molecule inhibitors of different proteins have come to, to, to the scenario. And one of those is Vismodegib. Vismodegib, if you know this uh, drug, is a small molecule inhibitor of the hedgehog pathway. Uh, why, why this? Uh, why all these efforts have been devoted to this area? Because it, it's known that the inappropriate activation, so the hedgehog pathway, is involved in the pathogenesis of BCC. Um, there are many aspects for this. Uh, there could be the loss of functions of one of the you know, transmembrane receptor, which is called patch one, and this is one of the possibility. Or there could be the gain of functions of other receptor involved in the HA pathway, that is the smooth, uh, or called, friendly called small receptor, the sonic age of the Gly family transcription factor. So, so all these events can be ligand independent or congenic uh, drivers for the disease. Uh, well, now, inhibitors of the HOC uh, pathway that have uh, emerged in the recent year all showed to be promising potential therapeutics for this, uh, for this problem. Um, however, um, the, the most frequent and the most uh, you know, uh, used uh, molecule for this pathology, as I said, is the one that targets MO, sonic HOC, and GLY1. Now, some small inhibitors are now enter human clinical trials, and they call constitute successful proof uh, of concept studies uh, on patients that have defined genetic mutations in the hedgehog pathway. Uh, let's see what Vismodigib does in particular. Uh, Vismodigib binds to small, and in so doing, it should prevent the systemic activations of the forward signaling. Uh, the activity that we've seen so far uh, and the anti-tumor activity of this uh, that has been revealed so far from in vitro and in vivo study have evidence of the fact that there is an addiction of this tumor to small activity, which is an important uh, information. And the other important information comes from our uh, phase two clinical trials ongoing in Milan on this performed with Roche and Genetech. 
That is showing that specifically for metastatically or locally advanced BCC, we have a, a response rate of 30% for metastatic BCC and 43% for locally advanced BCC. A median duration of response is 6.7 months. And approximately 30% of metastatic and 20% of locally advanced BCC of patients, unfortunately, do not respond to therapy. So the arena is very, very complicated, you know, and, and, and quite, uh, unfortunately, interesting for this respect. Uh, okay, this drug has been approved on FDA uh, January 2012, okay? We have already uh, experience of resistance. So what is going on? The first thing has been ev evidenced, uh, evidenced was the acquired resistance to vismodigis and canal medulloblastoma. Uh, the authors, the paper this published, uh, this, uh, published this paper in Science, showed that there was a dramatic response to the drug, really dramatic, but uh, that immediately or very soon re reverted into resistance to the acquisition of the point mutation in small, and the point mutation was this one that they detected. How, what did this mutation? They proved in this beautiful paper uh, of science that they prevented vismodigy from binding, that in so doing, the drug did not alter the ability of SMO to activate the downstream EJOC pathway, and so far, there's no mechanism available for a primary or quite resistant to vismodigies in BCC. So what is the evidence that we have? I will present you two cases and discuss briefly with you these two cases. So, so one case is a case of primary resistance, that's what we presume are primary resistance, and another one is acquired resistance to vismodigy. Uh, and I will propose a molecular-based mechanism that is still, of course, under validation, but it makes some sense why we can uh, distinguish the two mechanisms underlying primary and secondary resistance to vismodigy in BCC. Uh, so the, the patient, the first patient, the first case I would like to show you is, uh, or talk to you about, it was um, an elderly woman that was presenting to the hospital with a BCC metastatic to the liver, lung and bone. Uh, the histological confirmation uh, of uh, metastasis was uh, uh, done by liver biopsy. This lady received radiotherapy to lumbar and cervical metastasis. Uh, then she was set on a mismodigy regimen of uh, 150 milligrams per day for two months. And unfortunately, uh, as you can see on, my, uh, uh, on, on your right hand side here, that uh, the CT scan showed the progressions at outside. So there was no use for this lady to take this modigy inhibitor. Then, sorry, I, I know it's lunchtime, it's not very good to show this, but it's also really something that, you know, uh, has to be seen what this type of cancer can lead to. That this, the second patient, that is a 78-year-old um, man, that presented with a very large and ulcerated uh, skin lesion that was biopsied with diagnosis of BCC. This man was immediately set on the same regimen of his modigib, and what we see is was that it was a dramatic lesion reduction uh, after uh, month one, and an almost a complete clinical, declare almost complete clinical response after month six. So, uh, old fairy tale, you know, has to, to come to an end at some point. And then at month 11, the same person represented with the subcutaneous uh, nodules in the same area. They were surgically removed, and histology confirmed a pattern of recurrent BCC. So that's what we call secondary resistance. So we took specimens from the pre-treatment BCC liver metastasis from the first patient, and pre-treated primary tumor and recurrence arriving due to bismodigy regimen for the second patient. We screen all exons 1 to 23 of patch 1, and these that are from the literature known as the most involved exons of SMO uh, for mutations in BCC that were amplified by PCR and avoid directly sequenced. And what we found out, the reason is that no patch 1 mutation were observed in the pretreated BCC liver metastasis sample, so patch 1 was right type in the, in the in patient number 1, but Concurrently, he, the lady had missness mutation in the gene that was located at exon 9 SMO that translated for this protein mutation uh, in SMO. The second patient had a different scenario. So the second patient had already 
a mutation in patch one. Okay, and this patch one mutation predicts, as you can see, a translation of a truncated protein. And this is really not what, not what evidence because the loss of function mutation in uh, patch one gene has been associated with small activation. And SMO was wild type in the pretreatment sample, but featured a mutation in the uh, exon 8 of the SMO gene that translates for this mutation here in the protein. So you see the two different scenarios. So the patient that had primary resistance was one set, and the second who had claimed to have a secondary resistance is the other set. So what are the experiments going on? It's very tricky. There's no reliable cell lines. We have, with if with big efforts with a French and a, UK, a US group, we are now putting our cell lines able to perform experiment with uh, in BCC. So the models are, are very, very difficult to get. But so far what we have seen is that we did not detect so far uh, small locus amplifications in the specimen. Uh, we check uh, the uh, functional state of the, the mutants more, and so far what we got is the expression levels of these mutants are similar to uh, the wild type SMO, and the uh, induction of the edge of pathway is still ongoing. And most of the research is still ongoing. So how it is the determination whether these mutations impede the ability of this mode to inhibit the hedgehog signaling, and as well the ability of this uh, um, stop codon in patch one to suppress small wild type activity. Uh, these are all ongoing. I told you it's very recent results, so I have no more evidence in that. And this is why they call up for modeling, because they just wanted to know whether there could be a molecular explanation for what is going on at the molecular endpoint. So we discover here that um, for this mutation here, so this is for the case of acquired, so-called acquired resistance, uh, this uh, amino acid this is really involved in a quite unique mechanism. It's a triad of residues that clamp one another and keep the shape of the binding site in place for the drug to bind in the wild type protein. If you mutate these um, negatively charged amino acids in aspartic with the um, tyrosine, uh, this uh, H-bond network is really uh, disrupting, so the um, cavity is changing shape, and the drug cannot fit any longer so tightly. So it goes in and comes out. It goes in and comes out, as it happens all the time with these mutations. Uh, and if you want to quantify this, you can see here, now you know all the numbers, no secret for you, so the calculated IC50 for the wild type SMO is 2.5 nanomolar at this, this experimental value, and these value increases dramatically in the presence of the mutation. So the mutation is really affecting the affinity of the drug for the proteins. No use to give, at least for what the in silico predictions are concerned, uh, give this uh, drug to this protein, to, to this patient carrying this protein. And this can be a quantified, if you want, you could go on and on, uh, you know, digging into the molecular mechanism. But what you can see here is the difference between the wild type and the mutant protein in terms of the effort, uh, the, the um, contribution afforded to binding by each single amino acid in the binding site. And when you see more negative bars, now you know that the situation is more favorable. When you see more or less negative bar, you know that the situation is less favorable. And here you see immediately that by changing from wild type to uh, the mutant residue, uh, you lose a lot of grip. You lose a lot of grip. And then here, you see just for one single amino acid, which is uh, the um, arginine 400 in, in, with respect to the 473, when you change your pass from the wild type to the mutant residue, you have a dramatic loss of free energy binding, so a dramatic decrease in protein affinity. Well, so far you have understood this. It's more or less the same mechanism we described for KIT. But what is new for these other points, for the primary mutation? Look at where the mutation is. It's really far from the binding site. So how can a mutation really far from the binding site disturb drug binding? Because it's intuitive. If it's in the binding site, you change something, everything gets readjusted, maybe in the negative way, so drugs cannot enter the binding site. But what if I wave a hand so far and something happens you know, on the other extreme when I wave the other hand? So we, for this point, we devise an, a different type of experiment. So we study how the drug 
comes within the binding site to see whether there is any difference if we have mutant protein or wild type protein. In other terms, we don't only look at the thermodynamics of binding, but we look at the kinetics of binding. So we are looking time now, not only energy, okay? So you see here is a nice example of how the drug gets rid of the water and gets into the binding site, and then in this case, now the, the, the drug is leaving again. The binding site gets rehydrated and happily flies in the solution. So using this kind of experiment here, now I need to make a trick. We compare, we perform the same experiment, and here you have the wild type protein, and here you have the mutant one. And you will see that for the same simulation time, you will see the difference, you can tell what is going on. So this is one, and this is two. And you see, the, except for the little delay that I have to, because I have to switch the two, the two movies, you see that given the same kind of simulation, here the drug is almost already entered the protein binding side and is now getting very comfortable within his cavity. But for the same time, this guy here is not yet there, and so we prolong a little bit of simulation, no way. So the drug is still outside the binding side. What does it mean? Does it mean that there is an obstruction uh, to the way the drug enters the protein, and so the distal mutation impedes the drug from entering to the binding side. This can be quantified uh, with complicated diagrams and uh, that shows the force required to pull the drug into the binding site in the case of the wild type and in the case of the mutant. And you see that, of course, it's very easy to understand that the force is much, much less in the case of the wild type than in the case of the mutant. But if you take the um, gradient of the force, you have the energy. So you can look at this graph exactly at the same way. So it, it requires much, much less energy for the drug to enter the binding sites in the case of the wild type that in the case of the mutant. So, and if I make the same calculation that you are now very acquainted to, you will see that this, this reflects also in a thermodynamic aspect. So, of course, the drug is, once it gets struggling a lot into the binding site, it will still bind with less efficacy. So for primary mutations like this one, we have a combination of effects. We have effects of thermodynamics, and we have effects of kinetics. So much, much more complicated thing. So we have two cases of ismodogy resistance in BCC, where the primary resistance was uh, patch one, uh, wild type, and the SMO that has this kind of mutation in the pretreatment, and then acquired resistance, which is patch one that has this stop codon that supposedly activates SMO. The SMO is wild type, but is activated by this mutation here in the pretreatment, and then the same mutation is conserved in the recurrence, but the recurrence has this uh, mutation here. And we claim, all to be confirmed, of course, that the primary resistance uh, is bound to the fact that uh, we have a distal conformational change induced by the presence of the mutation that prevents the drug from reaching the binding sites. And when it reaches the binding sites, it does it less effectively. And which in, on the other hand, for the secondary resistance, the direct effect is on the drug binding pockets. It's much more classical in its um, uh, conception, if you want. So let me just show you uh, the last topic. I will take a little while. Uh, and it's uh, an example of how we can uh, design uh, an inhibitor in cancer therapy and com again combine, co compare evidences from computer and experiments to verify the hypothesis. Uh, well, this is another well-known protein. Uh, okay, I don't need to spend much time on talking about the STAT family. Um, just to say, uh, they are key elements in many oncogenic pathways, and nowadays are really, uh, they constitute really attractive targets for development an anti-cancer drug. Well, interfering with this um, uh, kind of protein that has such complicated activity is not easy. It's a very difficult task. Uh, and one of the proof for this is a very, very few small molecules have reached the clinical stage as inhibitors of STATs. Uh, then in, in a partnership with a Japan-American company, which is called Otsuka Pharmaceutical, and with the EOZERB, which is the Institute, uh, um, Oncology Institute of Italian Switzerland, an Institute of um, Research in Biomedicine of uh, Bellinzone in Switzerland. 
um, as long as five years, I guess, if I remember right, maybe Eric, uh, this is why my collaborators sitting in the audience can confirm, it's a good five years to study and develop this guy here, which is, I cannot show you the detailed structures, of course, but that's no problem you mentioned it, it's the OPB31121, which is a compound that is currently get to the clinical trials for different cancer types. Uh, uh, what was the problem? Uh, the Totsuka developed this drug and went straight away to clinical trials in Korea and Japan. Uh, but the funny thing is that the mechanism of this drug, uh, the mechanism of action of this drug, was not uh, unequivocally demonstrated. Uh, we all know that it targets STAT, and STAT3 in particular is about, but quite selective with respect to all those STATs, a little bit on a selectivity towards STAT1, probably, and maybe for some STAT5, but it's a pretty much selective for STAT3. Uh, so Otsuka asked us uh, and, and the Swiss uh, colleagues to combine experiments and um, experimental approach to uh, confirm or dig into uh, details of molecular tar targeting the, the, the definition, possibly identify the mode of interaction of this drug with that tree, and yield some basic uh, in vitro and vivo uh, biological effects of this STAT3 inhibitor. So what we've done uh, is start first all the time, and that, that's uh, the, the curse of our group, is that we have first to go to prediction. Uh, so we, uh, STAT3 is a very big molecule, I'll show you at the beginning. It's a, it's a really complicated, a lot of domains. Uh, so we search the entire molecule for a place for OPB31121 to uh, dock onto the protein. And we um, were pretty confident that the docking place for this drug was an SH2 domain of STAT3. So we perform our simulations, uh, taking OPB31121 as our lead compounds, and then we used also some of the most popular, let's say, uh, STAT3 inhibitors on the market, uh, and performed the same calculation for comparison. Um, please keep in mind that static is, is, is a rather um, special uh, inhibitor because it's the only covalent inhibitor of the series. All those other compounds are not covalent inhibitors of STAT3. Uh, what you see from our predictions, at least, is that OPB31121 is at least two orders of magnitude more effective than any other inhibitor of STAT3 so far available on the market. Uh, the reason why is because, first of all, OPB is a bigger molecule, uh, so it might interact with more amino acids once it docks onto the protein. And our molecule, uh, mo molecular modeling predict that uh, OPB, that's an interesting point, it's OPB31121 uh, docks on the SH2 domain of STAT3, but in a different pocket with respect to another pocket where most of the other inhibitors are presumed or supposed to bind by our own calculation and by what is this reported in the literature. So we have a drug that goes another way and binds much more tightly. Will this be true? Uh, well, we went to test this. So we produced and expressed the SH2 domain of uh, STAT3 and did some isothermal titration calorimetry experiment. Um, so what these curves tell us? So the first curve is the in vitro binding OPB 31121 uh, to the SH2 uh, domain of STAT3. And the curve is very nice. I don't know if you use these techniques. This technique is very, very sensitive and very uh, useful for example to validate the data that we produce. So the sigmoid typical curve and uh, the flex of the curve gives you the stoichiometry uh, of the interaction and this gives you intensity of the interaction. And as you see, there is interaction one-to-one, -one, drug and SH2 domain. And by doing the right extrapolation for this curve, the KD for uh, drug and SH2 uh, domain binding interaction is in the range one to 10 nanomolar. Uh, when we do the same thing for one of which, I just present one of the results. For instance, I took the SI3 uh, alternative inhibitor of SH2 domain of STAT3. You see that we still have a binding, but which is much, much weaker. And then the KT extrapolated is eight micromolar. And another interesting point is, do you remember I showed the graph? SI3 should bind in a different pocket with respect to the predicted binding pocket of 31121. 
So what we did, we pre-soaked the SH2 domain with SI31 and then titrated uh, this complex with OPB3112. And what you see is that we have the same type of binding. That means that uh, the binding site for, uh, for OPB3112 is free for OPB3112 to bind. That in other words, means that uh, SI3 is bound on another pocket. They are two not interfering. They are not competing for the same binding site. Just so kind of quick to the conclusion. So what we did is to verify further the binding mode. Okay, it's a, it's just a quantitative way of binding, but it doesn't tell us where it binds. It just tells us that they, these two drug bites in different pockets, but they don't tell us. They tell us that this one is binding stronger, the other one is weaker, but they don't tell us. Uh, where they bind onto the SH2 domain. So we performed first in silico and then in vitro, alanine scanning mutagenesis. They, you can repeat the two techniques in the two different ways. And from our analysis, we saw the two crucial amino acids, according to our model, for the binding of OPB3121 to uh, the SH2 domain was serine 636 and valine 637. Uh, so what we did is to first do this computationally, so we swap amino acid with alanine and get these results. Now you, know, you can read this table and you can see that in the case of OPB31121, uh, we predict a substantial decrease of affinity of binding. Look at the number, you remember 0, 0.0 before and now 5 uh, in terms of micromolar for uh, in the case of OPB a very, very scarce effect in the case of SI3. Same said for this amino acid here. What does it mean? Does it mean that these two residues are really important for OPB31121 binding and are not important for the other inhibitor binding? It's an indirect proof that the two drugs bind to different parts of the protein. So coming to the, uh, to the experimental evalu evaluation of our prediction, and uh, here you got, now you know what is, these are, the curve of ITC, and you see that in the presence of the two mutant proteins, uh, um, the um, serin and the um, valine, OPB31121 is no longer able to bind experimentally. So once you mutagenize the protein and then you did the experiment by ITC, at the same point, using the mutagenized protein, and you try to, you combine it with SI31, you still have a very, very nice binding. So in concluding, I will show you then what we did in, um, uh, well, again, more experiment from the biological standpoint. So you can see here the inhibitions of STAT3 phosphorylation are two very important residues that get phosphorylating when uh, STAT3 is activated, so it's, uh, um, uh, tyrosine sits uh, 705 and serine 725. And this has been performed in two different prostate cancer cells, DU145 and LENCOP. And you can see here that you have here different concentration. See, here's nanomolar of OPB, and you see that the stat are really, the phosphorylation of these two uh, residues get switched off at very low concentrations of this. If you consider other pay attention on the scale, other inhibitors, okay, so like the one we said before, cryptotanshinone, static, or SI3, and other, then we get the same effects at the micromolar scale. So the drug is really, really potent. It has some problems of bioavailability that we are working on because it's a really complex and big molecule, but it is really effective. So we tasted also the uh, inhibitions of cell proliferation and colony formation by stat inhibitors. And you can see here the comparison with the OPB and all other inhibitors. There's no uh, doubts about that this drug is really much, much more effective than all other, other uh, available inhibitor in, um, in the arena. And then this is the last brand new results. And then, uh, okay, this is, this is a change of uh, labeling here because you know that the pharmaceutical uh, companies call them in different ways, so I apologize for not having changed this, but it's the same molecule. And here you see some example of in vivo effects that we've done with, um, with mice here, and you can see the growth of the EU-145 tumor xenograph assessed by tumor volume and weight in the live panels and the vivo bioluminescence and other uh, experiments that has been done. So actually, 
uh, these drug seems to be in the arena of statin inhibitors, one of the most promising drugs uh, on which we have to work on. Should I go on five minutes more? It's 55 minutes. People are killed, am I okay? No, just really quick, okay? Just to show you, steady, I'm on the last topic, okay? So I know that you here work with viral vectors. So my experience is not with viral vectors or something different than that. I'm working with not viral vectors, so what is called lipoplexis or uh, carboplexis. So uh, then, you know those stuff. I have been working with, uh, for years with Mauro Ferrari. I don't know if it's an honor or a blame, but I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to, to, about this experience because I learned a lot. Uh, and about all the stuff, so nanomedicine that you probably know better than I. So I don't need to make a lot of advertising about nanomedicine, e what nanomedicine is and how nanomedicine um, can be exploited uh, in different fields of life science with the ultimate goal in any case to improve the quality of life of everybody. Um, th there are three main uh, nanotechnology areas in the healthcare that you can use and exploit. Uh, nanomedicine, that is a diagnosis a sensor that can be used outside the patient, something that innovative imaging agents that go from cells to patients, and the innovative technologies uh, like biomaterials uh, for drug or, or uh, new, new molecules for drug delivery, uh, tissue engineering and retain. As a teacher of nanotechnology, I'm a part of the, of the um, uh, teacher's board of the PhD School of Nanotechnology uh, in University of Trieste. Uh, I have a warning for you, and one of the warning is that there is this general, this is a uh, semantic issue, and it is the uh, increased tendency for everybody to uh, call nano medicine nanoparticles, okay? So nanoparticles are, uh, the, the term is really wrong. Uh, first of all, it's wrong because it is scientifically inaccurate, nanoparticles are by their own a specific class of nanomedicine. We will say that they're not. So it generalized the term could be very dangerous and could be very dangerous also in this uh, respect because uh, besides being not helpful and to disregard all unique feature of each class of nanomedicine by which nanoparticles are a part of, it may be very dangerous and misleading in a regulatory setting. So please, when you go ahead, just give the name to nanomedicine with the proper name, either liposome, dendrimers, and um, block copolymers, whatever, or nanoparticles, but nanoparticles are really something in their own. So the market, you know about this, there are first generations nanomedicine that now already entered the routine clinical use. And here are some examples, are they are blockbusters, or they are products that come to such an age that are soon become generics. Or there are second generation nanomedicine that's been developed in the late 80s and 90s and then are now in clinical trials of development. And here you can find some of these, maybe most of these names certainly sounds familiar to you. And, and this is why I was showing you the scale and the names of some of the example of the uh, materials that we have available for medical applications in nanomedicine. You see the different scales and you see the different names. So we have, for instance, self-assembly systems. We're going to show you a little bit, a couple of examples now here. You have block copolymer mices. You have polymer protein and polymer drugs. See the different scales. They are acting on the liposomes. The nanoparticles at the very end of the top of the scale, the nanocapsule that can reach the size of the micrometers and on. Last but not least, uh, we have the third generations of nanomedicines, which are those based on the innovative, most innovative uh, technologies that are still in the embryonic phase, but they have all, all the potential to become you know, uh, the, the, the true expressions of, of, of nanomedicine. So they can have acting as diagnostic tool and a therapeutic tool, so bringing the two into the, the, the new paradigm of teranoxic. Uh, well, the, the most effective new uh, way to produce a new nanolead um, actually should arise from a rational design rather to the other way around. So to make it and screen it approach, it takes too much long time. Um, there's, there are two ways to design on the medicine. There's one approach that you look for a pharmacological target and then you produce new chemical entities, which could be low molecular weight or macromolecular weight polymers. Or that, that might be a very risky trick because you can work years and years and years in the lab, so the preclinical stage, then you go to the clinical stage and 
it's very likely that you have some disagreement between the two. This is one of the typical, most famous case in which you disappointed in clinical trial phase three, you discovered that the in um, non-inferiority endpoint, your drug is uh, much less inferior than the available current drug for clostridium difficile uh, acute diarrhea that was the case. So the other way is to do the other way around. So develop nanovectors that improve the qualities of your drug by um, increasing the bioavailability, by protecting from degradation, by focusing and targeting the drug to a specific site. So these can also ensure that you have a nice uh, pharmacological, uh, pharmacokinetic profile with a control release. And at the very end, you will come up with the infamous multi-purpose nanovector that have everything inside. So something to cure, something to uh, look at, something to um, um, target, and so on and so forth. So I will just come with the, my point, uh, my, my end point by showing you an example, but just I would like you to focus on these numbers. So at the moment we have 40,000 clinical trials and 16,000 is, they are devoted to new anti-cancer drug. Pay attention to the second number, only 70, only 70 out of the 16 um, uh, uh, clinical trial for anti-cancer drug involve nanomedicine. So the percentage is very low, despite the fact, you know, that everybody talks about this. Um, most of these clinical trials are follow-up, you know, are, are uh, you know, um, bettering uh, the properties of already in existing medicine and the combinations of first generation products for improved formulation, enhance uh, uh, APR and so on. Let me switch to the last example in a five minutes which is a transition proof of concept for ovarian cancer. Uh, well, you know that in OC, uh, the PI3AKT pathway is one of the main drivers for this cancer. Um, the gene that expresses AKT is amplified in the 40% of OC, and the 36% of OC AKT is activated in this situation. And its activation tightly correlates with the aggressiveness of the disease and the poor outcome. Of, of the patients. There exist um, kinase uh, inhibitors for AKT, like this one. Uh, however, they are poorly effective and very, very expensive at the moment. So you will need to find something else. Uh, one of the alternative ideas to use uh, RNA interference. I am going to talk to uh, an expert audience about this, so I will not dwell with details. What you can see, you, you know what the, the principle is, is you should transfect cell with a small double-strand RNA sequence that is able to antagonize the corresponding mRNA. Uh, is a highly specific process uh, of uh, inactivation of uh, post-transcription and gene inactivation, and it's a natural process that brought our colleagues, much more respectful colleague, to the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. Uh, but it's too nice to be true uh, because CIRNA are intrinsically unstable and subjected to uh, RNA's degradation as soon as they enter this bloodstream. Uh, and SIRNA, as a being in nucleic acids, is a highly negatively charged. There's no way of having CRNA passing to the uh, biological membranes as, as a naked piece of DNA. So we need nanovectors, we need nanovectors for an ACE degradation, cellular uptake and promotions, and pharmacokinetics and uh, biodistribution improvement. So, as I said, the design should start from, the, the, the development this should start from the design, not the other one, from a reason design. So we work a lot for many, many years in trying to find molecules that produce a nanovector that is able to grab cRNA, bring it into the bloodstream, go or whatever, can enter the cells and deliver the cargo at the right point and the right moment. It's not easy. Uh, nanotechnology gives you a beautiful means to do that. It's a self-assembly. So you can use molecules that are smart and know how to get together to generate a specific nanovector with specific properties. And they know how to disassemble eventually to release the payload. Uh, so that, that was the result of what we thought, that this is one of the molecules we designed and we simulated whether this molecule under physiological condition were able to generate mycelles, and that was the case. So we predict that this guy here should be a micelle. We calculate the critical micelle 
um, concentration. We calculate the diameters of these uh, uh, mice, the aggregation number of these mice, the surface charge. And interesting enough, we get a very, very good agreement with the post-determined uh, uh, critical micellar concentration. So that means that the uh, in silico work, work a little bit for, for this, uh, uh, also in this case. Then we took some snapshot from the simulation and predicted that there were you know, aggregations of spherical mice. We went to clear TM and TN, and we found that it was exactly the case. So the dimension is exactly what we saw four or five nanometers. This is a scale about 20 nanometers, and there are spherical mice, so more or less of the diameter that we predict. Another thing that we can do is to know whether the nanovector is able to grab the cRNA. So far, it was for the mice. Is it able to do that? And once it grab the DNA, is it able to induce compact DNA, or cRNA in this case, to induce compaction in order to, you know, uh, engulf it and protect it? You have to imagine many mice around this to compact and protect this for RNAs. And this is a, mo a movie from a simulation that we perform. So you can see here a nanovector that has grabbed a piece of small interfering RNA and is dwelling against him. So he's trying to, you know, compact to minimize the, um, to maximize actually the interactions and maximize the uh, electrostatic interaction between the positively charged nanovector and a negatively charged ion. This is true simulations of atoms. What you see in the background is water and ions. This is all simulations with down the physiological ionic strength. At the very end, you get got a very nice compact nanoparticle. And so at the very end of a story, we have uh, a prediction of how affine this nanovector is for the small interfering RNAs that nicely correlated with the experimental values of the binding. We have nice compactions of the DNA or the small interfering RNA in this case by our molecules. And this is the gel shift assays that show you how this can be prevented degradation for RNAs. And then for the bio, and then I will really close the seminar, let you go to lunch, you will see some of the results that we obtained with this, I repeat, in silico design nanovector. So we have specific inhibition of AK3 and its downstream effector P70 exerted by uh, AKT cyanide deliver with this specific nanovector. There's no denial that these things here is really working very nicely. And you have to consider that it's a really tricky thing to uh, you know, deliver, produce, design, deliver, and get effective silencing with all this machinery. Uh, another interesting thing is that <clears throat> when you use this nanovector and the small interfering RNA, uh, the AKT knockdown produces, uh, reduces the uh, proliferation of the cells. And interesting, there's a rise of the caspase, that is a signals of apoptosis going on. Uh, so you have here, for instance, the, the, the uh, profile of the caspase 3. So you see the caspase 3 is rising when much, much more when you use the uh, cRNA with the, the um, delivered nanovector. Uh, and if you, if you remember, when the one of the last I say that one of these things should be used in combination therapy because it's the most effective way to produce nanomedicine today. And this is an example how you can use small interfering RNA delivered with a nanovector in combination with uh, toxic therapy like paclitaxel. And you see clearly from the results that when you use both in combination, the results that you get are much, much more effective than uh, in the separate cases. And last but not least, uh, coming to uh, the results that you can get in vivo, you will see that there is a strongly reduced tumorigenesis after uh, you knock down AKT with the system. And of course, what you can expect is that if you have, just to, to focus on this curve here, for instance, this is a scramble uh, interfering RNA delivered with the nanovectors. You expect no way of, uh, as it has to be, of action. And then you have a good, good reduction uh, in tumorigenesis when you use the uh, small interfering RNA with the nanovector and the best of actions is when you go in combination therapy. And this is, of course, the uh, photography of the uh, shrinking of the tumor. Uh, I would like to uh, close this really <laughs> fast talk of a lot of, uh, of, uh, of input that I hope that I gave you. So where the combinations of modeling and simulations and experiment can come together for 
uh, for dwelling and digging into most of the biological problem. I hope that I have awakened the curiosity of some of you, and of course you can contact me anytime if you think that you can have a problem that might be solved or at least understood uh, by using also combinations of computer science. Uh, because I, I'm firmly convinced that uh, the successful in, in this field stems from the maximum integrations of multidisciplinarity, but not only between biology, but between biology and doctors and medical doctors and engineers and chemists and physicists, because when nano comes into play, uh, we can raise bars uh, against us. We have all to undertake the problem for our different viewpoint in order to make the puzzle complete. Um, and there should be a full partnership, not only between academia or centers of research as we are, but I really outspeak that this will you know, involve also industry and regulators. And with this, I really thank you for your patience and I hope you enjoyed this seminar. I thanks once again, Mauro, for uh, hosting me today. <laughs> it is a funny thing, um, the very end of nanotechnology risk that we will get to the very good nanomedicine, but it will be a little bit tough to take the nanomedicine to make it work. Mauro, thank you again, and thank you all for your patience.